Man, oh man, oh man, oh man. I wish, I wish uh, that I could... How, do you, how would you put it? I wish that I could play off mistakes and the like as well as you guys do. You know, there, there takes, it takes talent to do that, of which I have none. And that's why I, I was left to take this, uh, this pastor position. <laughs> I'm surprised I didn't hear an amen in the midst of that. <laughs> Oh, goodness, no. Thank you, guys. And if I wouldn't have known, what would you say, key, chord, whatever it was, I wouldn't have known one way or the other. I'd just sing over there. And, I, and the, if I had a little spit curl in the back, that would remind me of way I, the way I sing. It just, it's going to come out right, wrong, or indifferent. I feel like, uh, what was his name on Little Rascals? Was it uh, Alfalfa? Man, when that guy tuned up, man, he was, whoo, oh my goodness, yeah, that's about the best you're going to get out of me as far as singing goes. Thank you guys so much uh, for the blessing uh, that y'all are to lead us in worship before God's throne. Man, 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 something awesome to look forward to on these Sundays. We are continuing in our study in the book of Acts. We have made it all the way to chapter 19. I mean, we're rolling. We are blowing through here. One of the things I think you guys will recognize as we are continuing this study, the, my pace may not be picking up, but the pace of the story in Paul's life and his ministry is. I mean, it is like uh, he's, he's made it, you know, almost like one of those uh, roller coasters. Y'all know the tick, 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 as you're waiting to get to that pinnacle, to that peak. And then it's... Uh, you know, hold your toupee in your dentures. You're just going down. And that's sort of where we are in, in this story. Uh, and I hate to use that term because that, it, it almost takes away from the magnitude uh, of this testimony that is Paul and his ministry. So one thing we're going to do that's going to be a little bit different today than we're accustomed to, you know, normally, just like good... Baptists go, we, we go down these chapters that are given, and then we go in order of the verses. Now, at one point in time, I think I was a couple years old when this took place, they put chapter divisions and verses in the Bible. And the, but there was a time when it just all ran together. And if you've done any kind of study in Greek, when I say run together, it ran together. One word, after, I mean, one letter after another, all the way across the page, all the way back. There was no breaks, no punctuations, no nothing. I utilize that as a, as a reminder that we think that we are growing in status as human beings, that we are, we are so advanced, you know. Uh, but I think we're actually devolving. We may have technology that is propping us up, but as far as a people group, I think we're literally devolving. And I can't do much more devolving, ladies and gentlemen. If I, if I do, it's not going to be good. I mean, it's everything I can do to keep this from growing together right here. And if just a couple more inches and these knuckles would drag the ground. So, all that to be said... We are going to mix it up a little bit this go round and sort of jump verses almost backwards. But there's a reason for this. I'm going to tell a little story and then we'll start in a prayer. Um, there was a Major League Baseball player in the 60s and 70s named Frank Robinson. Some of you may know that name. Uh, he was a... 14-time MVP. He is the only baseball player to have that title, MVP, for both the American or uh, the, what is it, uh, the two divisions in baseball. I, I, for, there you go. There you go. American and National Leagues. And he is, of course, a baseball uh, Hall of Famer. But in... 
1973, there was an article in Time magazine where they were interviewing him, and he basically said a, a quote that you guys have probably heard in your lifetime. He said, basically to the extent, close is not good enough in baseball. Close is only good in horseshoes and hand grenades. Have y'all heard that? Does that sound familiar? Well, there you, now you know who that is attributed to. And that's going to be the theme of our message today, is close is not good enough when it comes to Christ. Close is not good enough when it comes to our relationship with our Savior. We can know of Him without knowing Him. And we're going to see that played out through many lives in chapter, actually the first half of chapter 19 today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time of worship lifting our voices in praise to you and the things that you have done, the who that you are, as Miss Patty said, the what that you are that is indescribable. Lord, we thank you for making your presence known in our lives even when we're not seeking after you. Lord, and that's our prayer. That today as we open up your word, as we gather together, as we lean upon the guidance of the Holy Spirit to illuminate your word and to prod and provoke our hearts and our spirits, Lord, that we would take every minute of the days that we have left in growing closer to you, in acknowledging you, and proclaiming you before others. And may all that we do and say bring glory into the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. So, I've tried to determine how to exactly go about uh, doing this, to read this through and then come back and break it up. But I think we're going to do it a little bit differently. Sort of bookmark 19.1, which would be our normal starting spot. But we're actually going to start in verse 11. In verse 11 it says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, I've seen a few miracles in my lifetime. And I don't know of any of them that are usual. I don't know if you guys can say, Well, that's just, you know, that's just God. That's just His normal thing. No, every miracle is unusual. Every miracle is great. Every miracle is out of the norm. But I love this because it says that God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. So that he couldn't claim that this was of him or from him or anything else. And we'll see why as this continues. This was miracles by God and he utilized Paul to distribute, distribute those. So that even the handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. Now I know, I, I, you guys know that I'm a cynic at heart. And I immediately think of several pastors that I've seen, televangelists over the years, that if you send me a check for such and such amount of money, I will send you this prayer cloth and it's got my sweat on it and, and by God, praise the Lord, you will be healed of everything and you will be prosperous and all the nonsense I can think of that you'll swallow. <laughs> this is not that situation. Now, I can tell you this is probably where it is derived from, but this is not the case right here. But I, something that we spoke about in Sunday school this morning, and you know, I've got to put our plug in there. Sunday school for adults, 9.30 to, supposed to be 10.20, but you know, we're Baptists, so you know, you got to work around that. This morning we were talking about Apollos. And by talking about Apollos, we went back to his teacher, sort of his mentor, John the Baptist. And we talked about the fact that 
an angel of the Lord appeared before Zacharias, John's father, before his birth. And we, we mentioned that because this angel of the Lord was in the presence of God in probably days, months, years, eons that we can't describe and don't understand, he was in the presence of holiness. And because he was in the presence of holiness, that holiness adhered, or at least a part of that holiness adhered to that creation of God. So whenever you see an angel of the Lord appear to somebody throughout the Bible, they always have to start with, peace be unto you. Peace be still. Do not fear. It always started with something of that nature. Because in the midst of us and our sin, we are standing before something that is so much holier than us. And that's only a glimpse of what we can expect before God. This was just the light refracting from the holy God into a being before a fleshly being. And it garnered that response. And so I take that sort of... I sort of take that and, and, and apply it to this situation here. Because of the time that Paul spent in his ministry and in his relationship to God, that even the things that he wore had some of Christ adhered to it. Now, that's just me. That's not biblical. That's just the way I look at this. You can take that at face value. I would think, you know, of course, us being, you know, What's the, what's the term that we, it always escapes me because I'm so far from it. When you're, when you're there, you've, you've reached, the, reached the pinnacle. There's, a, there's, there's another term for it that it doesn't get spoken enough around us. I don't think we're close enough to it. Sanctified, fully sanctified or whatever they call it. Because I'm not, I don't get to use that word and remember it very often. But in this case, well, I would think as being the hoity-toity Baptist that I am, that my goodness, Lord, could you show up in something other than the sweat band? I mean, you're going to go through the sweat glands of Paul and everything else into these pieces of fabric? I know when I work, I work outside, ladies and gentlemen. I'm in the sun, cutting grass or whatever the case it may be for that day, and I'm going to tell you, I wouldn't let anybody take any of my clothing from me after a day's work. Oh, no, son, you don't want that. that it, that'll do the opposite of blessing you. That will, that will put an air about your whole house that you do not want part of. But in this case, in this case, Paul's handkerchiefs, his aprons were taken. He's walking in the house. He's dropped his car keys in the, in the bowl. And he's coming in. He's shedding clothes. You know how it's like us guys do. If, especially if the wife isn't there to catch no, you. No, you're not coming in here with that. Get the, outside, outside. Hose first. I, don't, I haven't quite got that bad, but close, close. These people were grabbing these things up. And they were placing them, and this is the thing we've got to think about, in faith to whom Paul served upon the sick and the lame. And they were healed. One of the other things we talked about in Sunday school this morning. I don't know if you guys realize this. I don't know if you have taken this in because it's hard. It's difficult to understand as fractured and broken and as sinful even in Christ as we are in the flesh in this fallen world. The same Holy Spirit that resided in Paul resides in you. Don't you think we are to strive a little bit harder? And I'm pointing at myself, ladies and gentlemen. Don't you think we are to strive a little bit harder in our relationship with our Lord and Savior that pays eternal dividends that people would think that by some chance the God that we serve 
may be manifest in their issues for the day through one of our garments. I don't know about you guys, but I've got some ground to make up. We see this taking place. And then, not only did it heal the sick, and diseases left them, and evil spirits went out of them. Sort of bookmark that in your mind, because we're going to read some more further into this. So we are seeing, we are seeing a relationship that is more than close enough. And we are seeing... The evidence of how tight that relationship is between Paul and his Savior that these things, these miracles manifested themselves in such a bizarre way. And you know, just like Simon the sorcerer, remember when we read about him earlier on in in Acts, when Peter came across him and rebuked him, thinking he could buy the ability to, by touching, touching or laying hands on somebody, they can receive the Holy Spirit. And Simon gave him the what, Simon Peter gave him the what for. We see the same thing take place here in verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, itinerant Jewish exorcists, man, just, Wow took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over, who, over those who had evil spirits, saying, and I love this part right here, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Uh-oh. You know this opens the door to a mess. So, they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So they go to the person that had the relationship or has a relationship, Paul, with Jesus Christ and utilize like a, you know, several step methods, almost like the, what is it, the seven connections to, what's his, Bacon, what's it, what's, Bacon. Kevin Bacon, there you go. It's almost like one of those scenarios. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cast a demon out of you for money none, nonetheless, for profit. I'm going to cast a demon out of you by going through this guy, this guy, this guy, and this gal, and this guy back to Jesus. Now love this. Also, there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. He did the same thing. Or they did the same thing. And love this. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know. And Paul I know, but who the blankety-blank are you? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Just put yourself in a situation like that. That there is someone demon-possessed in front of you. And you are going to go on second, third hand, fourth hand relations and call upon their name before the name of Christ Jesus to cast that spirit out of that person? Man, the audacity of that in and of itself is just insane. And we'll see the evidence of this right here in verse 16. Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Man. And what you also have to understand in that day and age, in this society, to be naked um, amongst the public, you didn't recover from that. That was one of those, honey, honey, we need to pack up and move. Here's what had happened was, you know, one of those scenarios. They got stomped. One individual, demon possessed, put it on these sons, these seven sons. So their little, their little venture, their little profit making system they had was shut down in an instant 
because they did not know Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Because they were living, everything that man manifested from them was the opposite of what Christ Jesus would have them convey in their day-to-day -day life. There's no Tom Fuller. There's no, there's no, hey, how can I make a profit in the midst of this? <laughs> and it makes me wonder, as I think about some of these churches and these evangelists nowadays that are proclaiming a false gospel. There is a reckoning going to take place. That reckoning is a is a I'm going to use the term because I don't, I don't know it. It's an accounting term. You are going to zero out the numbers, or at least they're supposed to. You are reconciling a statement. That reckoning is coming for all of those who falsely proclaim Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior and attach some type of foreign gospel to His name. And when that time comes, they're going to wish that getting a knot knocked on their head and run out naked was the end result. It's coming. It's coming. And here it is, just like, uh, just like in Keithville, verse 17. This became known to both all the Jews and the Greeks. They were down at s &A. Did you see them seven sons of Sigma? Ooh, did you see this? Did you hear about so-and-so? It happens, I don't know. You just have to be part of it. So we have the Jews and the Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and this is, this is a good result. You know, all things can be used for God's good. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Even... That situation, the Lord purposed to proclaim Himself. Now, I'm a little more thick-headed than most. I learn lessons a little bit harder than most. But I'm going to tell you, after reading this, I'm thinking, you know, you surrender, you serve like Paul did. There may be some bumps in the road, but that's the way to go. Not getting thumped in the head and bruised up and beaten and running down the road naked, I'm going to choose to serve him the first, first way, not the latter. But this word magnified, oh, here we go, I'm going to butcher this up. But I've got to use at least one Greek word a week because that's as fast as I can learn them. Megaluno. That's magnified. It's, it means to make great, to make known, to distribute widely. God's name, the, uh, the name of Christ Jesus was magnified. It was spread about, made known in the midst of the talk of the town. But because His name was made known, because His power was, was manifested in these two ways through the miracles and through uh, the story of these seven sons. Verse 18, And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Come on. We're having an old time tent revival now. Because the power and the majesty and the might of Christ Jesus has been made manifest through Paul's preaching, through the miracles that God did through Paul and his old sweaty garments, and using sort of a reverse type learning scheme with these seven sons of Siva, 
Christ Jesus was presented to these people in a major, mighty way. And what do we do when we realize our sin? And we realize who we're before? A holy God? And we realize that Jesus Christ is that son of that holy God. And through his sacrifice on that cross and his death, burial, and resurrection, we, we are his children adopted into the family of God. And I don't know about each of y'all's salvation experience, but the first thing is, Wait a second. There is stuff attached to me that I can't bring over into this relationship. There are things that I have done. There are things that I've said. There are things that I may be in the midst of continuing to do that have to go. They are not of the one who I say I follow. They are not an example of who it is to be a follower of Christ Jesus. And that is the very first thing that they do. They come confessing and telling their deeds. I'm going to tell you guys, one of the things that we have not done in churches for generations is to become equally yoked harnessed as a team pulling the wagon that is the church, that is Christ by doing that, sharing our burdens in such a way with other people. That old saying, no man is an island. That's, that's especially true of us as Christians. You can't sit there and say, well, I've got a spouse. You know, we share things, we talk. We carry one another's burdens. You know, there are some burdens that are going to be placed upon you that you need to go outside of yourself, of your spouse. In this day and age, men especially, pornography is so prevalent today, it's insane. And it's open and almost encouraged. It, it's like there's, there is the shame of it all is almost non-existent. And it is destroying the church. The bar, I think the most recent Barna poll mentioned that it was almost 90%, 89 and some change, of professing Christian men that have or at one time had a pornography addiction. Guys, that means Satan has a B grade in that venue. And I can tell you, as somebody myself who struggled with a pornography addiction, trust me, it doesn't affect just you. There are victims everywhere, especially if you're married. So what I'm saying that you are in the midst of a group of people that if this venue, being part of the body of Christ, is not an area where you can share, when you can lay down your burdens, or you can come alongside somebody else in your times of strength and help somebody in the midst of their weakness, then we need to close these doors. I've told you all many times, this is a place of safety. This is a refuge against that world. This is almost like uh, a triage unit. As we are all going about our daily lives and we're getting beat up and we're getting scuffed up and everything trying to serve Christ, we can come here and know that we are amongst people that will help us, will gird us up, will strengthen us, help us heal, and send us back out there. And that's what we're seeing right here in Ephesus. In Ephesus. <clears throat> and it continues. They're not just professing and confessing. 
Verse 19, also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. What we have to understand about Ephesus, Ephesus is like the hub of, I'm going I'm to call it demonic activity, because that's what it is. Today, we would put it together with like Ouija boards and tarot cards and things of that nature. These folks were idol worshipers, and then they went even further into taking part in creating potions, spells, different things of that nature. It was, it was sort of ingrained in the culture in Ephesus. And we're going to see some more about that next week as far as the idols are concerned. But that 50,000 pieces of silver, there's a, there's a couple of scholars that have done the math from that time to today. We are looking between one and a half and three million dollars worth of demonic books that were burned. That is insane. That's a lot of books. Now I look at this and I'm like, oh man, book burning. That's, that's not good. However, if you, look at, if you read this and you look into this, this wasn't your government telling you to burn books. This wasn't an association or somebody with a, a, an agenda telling you to burn books. These were people realizing that, hey, I'm sinning before a holy God and the things that I have within my house represent something that is not of God and it needs to go. Uh-oh, I may be stepping on some toes this morning. Maybe my own, I don't even know. I need to look, I need to go back and look. But this definitely makes you want to take a peek in your closet. This makes you maybe want to, oh no, we're, we're past all that. We got phones and everything else. I was going to say, you can maybe look under a mattress or this, that, or the other. You know, pull everything out of the cupboards and see what is in our homes today that is disrespecting or not honoring God. Ouch. Now there's a part of us that, you know, you, at least... These images that roll through my head and everything as I'm speaking, and, you know, if you see me chuckle or scoff or whatever, it's because me, myself, and I are having a conversation as I'm trying to preach. So you'll have to excuse this. But it's almost like you, you hear somebody say something like this and, oh my goodness, here comes the Puritan hats and the coats and everything else and we're going from house to house to house. Let's look and see what you have. No. No. That's right. We don't have to. And I can guarantee you, the closer, as we are talking about getting closer to Christ, the closer you get to Christ, the more you realize there are certain things that don't belong. The more the Holy Spirit provokes your spirit and says, man, I can't say this and do this and have this or do this. My grandfather, my, my grandparents rather, were the instrument in which God used to bring me to Him. It missed my mother's generation. But I'm thankful for the time I got to spend with my grandparents. And I, as an adult, we have our family get-togethers and, and our reunions. And as an adult, I heard my aunts and uncles, nine of them, you know, at that time, talking about Papa, my grandfather, saying, do you remember when he was so drunk that Nanny, my grandmother, smacked him upside the head with a, a skillet? Do you remember when Teresa, my mom, thought that he was a burglar and shot the propane tank out back of the old place that he was hiding behind? All these different things. And I'm like, who the heck are y'all talking about? You know, because two years before I was born, my grandfather gave his life to Christ. And I'm going to tell you what, I never saw the evidence whatsoever of that man that he once was. Ever. 
And when they started talking about that, I'm like, y'all better watch your mouth. You know, this, the, the, I don't believe this ever happened. I pray, I pray that my grandchildren get to see that change in me. Because he's doing it every day, every day that goes by. It's that refining by fire that takes place. And I've got a long way to go. But every day, I'm pure and pure and pure. Not by my own standards, by His. There's been almost 20 years I've been married to this beautiful lady right here. And I can guarantee you, she can say, oh yes, you do have a long way to go. <laughs> but she'll also tell you, almost like them Virginia Slim commercials back in the early 70s, you've come a long way, baby. We both have. And I praise God. Praise God for it. Verse 20 here, it says, So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what you... This word prevailed, I didn't look this up in Greek or anything like that, but I know what it means in English. It dominated. It did. It covered Ephesus. And if you want to see... How much it did cover Ephesus? Read book of the book of Ephesians. Paul's writing back to them, and there's there's really nothing negative that he has to say. They honored God. They when they when we hear that word repent and they turn from their wicked ways, literally, they turned abruptly. They didn't walk. They probably outrun those seven sons of Siva on the way out. But there was a change made in them so much so that we read the book of Ephesus and we're like, my goodness. To know historically and what Ephesus was and how it turned out. It is because of people seeing their sin in their life and being able to measure that against the holiness of God and realizing those two are not interlinked. They're not intertwined. But through Christ Jesus, they overcame. Through Christ Jesus, their lives manifested what had been done to and through them by the power of the Holy Spirit and it changed them. And now we're going to sort of flip this a little bit. Because we've seen evidence of those who are living their life with a relationship to Christ Jesus that have surrendered their lives to Christ Jesus and we see what manifested from there. And we've seen those who played Christians and what took place there. And let's add that we're going back to verse 1 and 19. And it, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. Again, we had that word certain, and then now we have some disciples. But I want us to look at this while Apollos was at Corinth. Remember, this is the onset of the third missionary journey of Paul and we know in the end of his second missionary journey, journey Corinth I don't know if we could chalk that up as a win it was pretty rough it was a low point in Paul's ministry a low point in Paul's life Jesus made an appearance to him in a dream and told him hey don't be afraid you keep proclaiming the gospel. You, you keep teaching and telling people about me. I've got a slew of folks in this town. And we saw how that played out before the Bema seat. And nobody laid a hand on Paul. He stayed there, what did we say, 18 months, I think it was. At that time was the longest time he had been anywhere stationary preaching and proclaiming except for here, and we'll read that here shortly. 
But Apollos, after he was sort of set straight or giving, given the gospel of Jesus Christ more fully through Aquila and Pris uh, Priscilla and Aquila, he said, hey, look, I want to go to Achaia with this new gospel message. And they said, that would be a great idea. And they wrote him letters of recommendation that went before him. And he was received there by the few who did believe at the end of Paul's second missionary journey. One of the things we need to see here, Paul is sort of coming back behind him in the third missionary journey, and he says he find, found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not even so much as even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. So these are some of the disciples that Apollos left behind not knowing about Jesus Christ. They were just one step. They were one step from knowing Christ Jesus as their Savior. Their relationship only brought them so far, but there was something missing. Do you know how many people have died, have passed from this earth one step away from knowing Christ as their Savior? That's a mighty big fall. One step into eternity, into an eternity in hell, an eternity separated from God. Just like Mr. Robinson's quote, close is not close enough. And you know, for Paul to ask this question of these people that he came into contact with, there had to be some evidence that there was not the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, he would, why would he have asked this question? And that's a rabbit trail we could go down maybe at another time. But there may have been things that were taking place or things these guys said or stuff that Paul witnessed them doing that he's like, hold on a second. Any good Christian would abstain from this. And therefore he had to ask this question. And he said in verse 3, he said, And he, and he said to them, And to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. And we studied that a little bit more in detail in, in uh, Sunday school this morning. Basically, John was a precursor, the prophet in the wilderness, proclaiming the coming of the Messiah. There was the aspect of repentance that was there. There was the aspect of baptism, but there was a water baptism into which... It was just a profession and a renouncing of a sin. Not the cleansing of all sin. That had to come from the spotless lamb that was Jesus Christ. So the message only came to a certain point. It was darn close. But it wasn't close enough. And Paul could have said right then, and said, huh. Well... Good to meet you guys. That's not Paul. And it shouldn't be us either. Verse 4 says, Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. He proclaimed Christ Jesus. They knew, they were led to that point, hey, we know there's a Messiah coming. We know we adhere to the Lord God we adhere to the Old Testament, the Mosaic laws. Everything brought them up to that point. And ladies and gentlemen, when you think your conversation with an unbeliever is fruitless, do you recognize the fact that you have brought them to a point that God has someone else 
to bring that to fruition, to bring that person into a knowing, saving salvation through Christ Jesus. Don't ever think that when you bring up the name of Christ Jesus in a conversation trying to lead somebody to Him, that it's fruitless. Scripture said that God's Word will not return to Him void. And we're going to learn a little bit later as we look and link Corinthians to where we are now that Paul himself is going to say certain people are meant to water or certain people are meant to plant, certain people are meant to water, but God gives the increase. God gives the increase. Do not hold back when the Holy Spirit prompts you to speak up. When you do not, one, you're causing harm upon the Holy Spirit. And what I mean by that, it's not like that we could harm Him, but we can grieve, grieve Him. And you're also saying at the same time, God, your creation here is not worth my time. Let that sink in. Let that sink in. You are telling God who came out of heaven in holiness and took on sinful flesh and bore our sins on a cross, shed His blood, surrendered His own life, as a spotless lamb, as a sacrifice for our sins, you're saying, Lord, I know I'm probably supposed to say something right now, but I ain't going to do it. Wow. Wow. And I can only say that because I've done it. I've done it. And there are some of those that are not here with us today that their names are going to come up at that beam of seat. And I know it. And I know there are some of, here, some of you here today that there is a name that has popped into your mind or in your heart that you can say the same thing about. I'm not going to say that there aren't others that I'll be able to present before the feet of my Lord and Savior. But there are. There are a few. What we do with the gift that we're given is going to be fully played out before the Bema Seat. I'm not telling you that in Christ there is, a, there is an opportunity for hell or any of that. In Christ, that's off the table. But there will be a time before the Bema Seat where our rewards are placed before us. And I'm going to tell you, I want to live my life in such a way now to where I am spending some credible part of that eternity laying those crowns before the feet of my Lord and Savior. This should be the thing that draws us nearer to Him at this point in our lives. And it should be the thing that we live our lives for from this moment forward. Especially with all that we're seeing taking place in this world today. We should be a city on the hill at this point in time more so than any point in time. Look at verse 5. When they heard this proclamation by Paul, coming behind Apollos, about Jesus Christ. It says, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all. 
We have seen throughout the book of Acts multiple times where the indwelling of the Holy Spirit was manifested or, or was physically manifested in such a way that they spoke in tongues. And when I say that, I'm not talking about ecstatic gibberish or anything of that nature. They were able to speak in a language that was not their own, that was able to convey a message again of probably Christ, well not probably, of Christ Jesus to those who witnessed it. Because that's where the power, that's where the inference of what took place goes to give Christ credit. Even in a situation like this. But we saw that with those in Acts 2 at Pentecost. We saw that when the Samaritans received Christ as their Lord and Savior. There was a reason for that. In that time, the, the Jews and Israel, the, the, well I say the Jews and Israel, the, the, the Jews in Jerusalem had a disdain and vice versa with the Samaritans. So whenever they came to Christ Jesus, there had to be something that they recognized to say, this is legitimate. What took place with us in Jerusalem at the day of Pentecost took place here. We saw the same thing when it came to proclaiming Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. Because if you think that the Jews and the Samaritans had no love lost, when it came to the Gentiles, the Jews looked at the Gentiles like dogs, even though they were under the boot of those particular dogs. So each of these occasions, tongues were used to say, the Holy Spirit has fallen upon each of these. We are witnesses of it. These people were brought up to a point in a relationship. And through the power of the Holy Spirit and utilizing Paul, they stepped over into that joyful union. And we see the evidence of it with them speaking in tongues. Verse 8, And he went to the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. I wish we had time to break all this down. But he did, Paul did what Paul does. He went to the synagogue first. He reasoned with them from the scriptures. He tried to persuade them that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And he expounded on the kingdom of God. That's sort of something new as we're opening up Acts. Now he is starting to expound. Hey, there is salvation in the present. And there is salvation in the future. And that's, that's a message I'll have to put together a little more specifically. But there... Our salvation is in three tenses. We were saved. We are saved. And we will be saved. I'll expound on that at another time. But just to give you something, uh, something to chew on. Now, the school of Tyrannus. Now, I thought this was Louisiana Baptist University. But can you imagine, I'm hoping that was a nickname that the students gave this dean of this, uh, of this school. Because just like what you see here, Tyrannus, 
means tyrant. And I've got a couple of those professors. But he opened up his school for Paul to utilize. Well, we, what we don't understand here, in that culture in that day, because of the, the climate that they were in, they worked from before sunup to about 11 o'clock, and then they took what we would consider a siesta. Everybody uh, sort of shut down through the hottest hours of the day. And then they would start back up again later in that evening as the sun was breaking. But in the meantime, Paul utilized this opportunity to be able to open up our first Bible college. So during that time, Paul was working, making tents, working with leather and the like, making ends meet. And then during his time of siesta or rest during the day, he utilized that expounding on Scripture and teaching people what we heard here called the way, the way of Christ, the walk of Christ. And then he went back to work building tents or making tents and fashioning leather and the like after this. That right there tells you that he was empowered with the Holy Spirit. Because that is a hard thing to keep up with. Look at the end result. And this continued for two years. He was able to stay unimpeded teaching the Word of Christ here at this time for two years. And you know what the end result was? That about a half a dozen people who dwelt in Asia heard the Word. No. It said all the people of that region both Jews and Greeks heard the word of Jesus Christ, of the Lord Jesus. Wow. Wow. Can you imagine? Let's, let's take this down to a smaller scale. What would take place if, if the people of North Keithville Baptist Church and the others around us, other churches around us, were so on, on fire for God, if the census folks came in, and I don't know when, the, when their next one is, but they came in, they asked a question, have you ever heard about Jesus Christ? They'd be like, oh yeah, because so-and-so at that church, and so-and-so at that church, and so-and-so at that church. I can't, even, I can't even be around them folks without them saying something about Jesus. That's our job. That's our duty. That is the very least that we can do for what's been given us. So what we have here today, ladies and gentlemen, is there is people, there, well, there is, there are people that we know that are playing Christian. There are people that we know that are far removed from Christ Jesus. And there are those that are far removed that said, oh yeah, I've heard of Jesus Christ. My aunt or my uncle or some family member, you know, goes to church and does this and does that. And, and they think that because they are associated with somebody else like these seven sons of Siva because I'm associated in a household. It may, it may be parents that have children that are not serving Christ, that don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Someone else's salvation and their relationship with Jesus Christ is not superimposed on you or them. It is our duty in our relationship and in our faculties that are given to us by the Holy Spirit as Christians, as followers of Christ, as followers of the way, as the Word says, for us to open our mouths and proclaim Christ Jesus.
It is for us to every deed that we do to show the love and mercy and grace of Christ Jesus. There will be a time, saved as we may be, that it will be laid out before us. I pray that that is our hearts today that we are going to strive from this point forward. Myself, first and foremost, that everything that I do, I'm going to say, Lord, does this honor you? Lord, alter my language. Alter my attitude. Alter my actions that everything that I do reflects you. There is a whole world that needs it. There is a whole world that doesn't even realize that Christ Jesus is the answer for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we thank You for this day. Lord, we thank You for Your Word that is more relevant and more true today than it has ever been. Father, I pray that you would strip us of our complacency. That you would make us fully aware of what it means to be your child. Yes, there is an inheritance that we can't even find words to describe. But yet there's a duty that's associated with being your child. Empower us through your word. Embolden us through your Holy Spirit. And Lord, for anyone that is here today that may not know you as their Lord and Savior, that one step is made easy. That one step begins with a prayer. And ends with your grace. Lord, if there is anybody here that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that it, they would come down, utilize this opportunity to say one single prayer. Father, I'm a sinner. My sins are committed against you and you alone. And I acknowledge you, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior. who gave Himself up willingly as a sacrifice to atone my sin, for my sins. Lord, accept me as Your child. Help me to turn from my past into Your bright future. That's it. That's simple as that. The Holy Spirit and this body will assist from that day forward. May your Holy Spirit prod, provoke, weigh, and burden. And Lord, may we celebrate those coming to know you when it's all said and done. In the precious and powerful name of Christ Jesus, I pray. Amen.